Kids here, Sandy Gamble, he's the incumbent for the school board, and Mike Garcia running for the same seat. So I think what we need to do is we all know you, but I still think you might want to just talk about yourself for a little bit, maybe your background, so we can hear it one more time and advance his taping so um, he can share this on. What I can't see it is Marie's drinking her coffee. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> you don't need to see it. My, my head, you want No. But that way, Don't Vance is taping, and that way he can share it on this page. Mm -hmm. And so if you make a real blooper, uh, I will remove it. I'm being <laughs> nice this season, you know. <laughs> so, who wants to go first? Yes, well, I said you. Yeah. I'll go first, but. And my name is Sandy Gamble, and you do know me. But what brings my background is that I worked for the school system for 22 years behind the scenes yeah, and the support so staff. So I, I've seen the good and the bad. I have a good rapport with the teachers as well as the administrators in the campuses. Now, I understand that one of my opponents being a teacher and one being a former uh, administrator, that they may gain some there, but a lot have already told me they support me because of what I stand for. I'm out to try to do anything and everything that I can to promote Lake County Schools, to keep and retain our highly qualified teachers, go out and recruit more highly qualified teachers to come in and teach our students in Lake County, and progress further. Our, since we have hired the superintendent, our graduation rate is increasing. The amount of dropouts that we have is decreasing. As I said last night in the forum that we were in, it went from 6.1 to 4.8. That's 1.3. That's a lot. And we're 23 out of 67 counties. And we said last night we have 69, but we only have 67 counties in, in Florida. So, uh, but also I understand the the, the budget. A lot of people think they have, they can they say I can read the budget. It's one thing to read it, but it's understand how the budget is put together and how it is divided. And not all the money that is shown as being as a total amount of the budget is able to be used in a general fund as we would like to see it done. Monies are, are earmarked, and that's where they have to be used and utilized in that form. Years ago, we had a cafeteria director, or actually supervisor of, caf uh, of uh, food service, that got released, and we subbed <coughs> out that next year to an outside source for our food service to be run by. The reason? Because she would not relinquish $2 million in her fund to repair roofs. You can't do that at a food service. You can't do repair work on the roof of a building that it should be maintained by us. So the federal USDA won't allow that. But she was released, and then the second year we brought back a food service supervisor and went forward to where we are today. My, my thing is, I want to continue what the superintendent has started. I don't want to put a wrinkle in it. I want to continue going forward. Uh, we had a debate about, at one time, about do we arm teachers. I did not want to see that we arm teachers. I talked with the sheriff at that time. He said that is not a good idea, that we just need to look at another way. So what we as a board came up with, all administrators that would like to go through the Guardian program, they can go through it, and then they are issued a revolver from Lake County Schools to help protect the students there on their campus if they graduate from that and the sheriff then deputizes them. So we as the Lake County School Board are doing everything we can possible to promote the students of Lake County. I will tell you this, we have a well-refined board and we work together. There's no ill feelings amongst us. We don't, if you watch any board meetings, you don't see us fighting or can be contentious against each other. But we have a love to make sure that everything that we do is for the purpose of the students of Lake County. And it's not a personal agenda. It's an agenda that is best suited for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, this is my turn, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, so I, I know that I'm new in the block. Not a lot of people know you know me from here, and, and I know you guys now after being around you for a couple of weeks, and I'm really happy to be around you guys during this time. Um, just to give you a little background on me, um, I am a New York City kid, uh, or we call a New Yorkian. I grew up in the South Bronx. Okay, and I'm just letting you know. Grew up in the South Bronx, and we grew up pretty poor. And I'm sure that everyone has their little store like that. Um, one of the things I learned, though, from that was value of work and, and good ethics. And that was something I learned early on because that was a way we were able to survive as a family, not just me, but as a family. Um, and my mom was a single mom for a long time because my dad spent a lot of time in prison. 
So one of the things that I try to tell people, and I'm not preaching right now, but I'm trying to say is some things like prison ministry and God really does help our country and help our families. Um, I believe strongly <coughs> that's the reason why I'm here before you, is that someone not talked to my father in prison and reformed him, he would have never sent him to the house to reform us. And then because of that, we came in. Um, I graduated high school. Um, and from there, I went to theology school. Um, I actually studied theology for two years. Um, I think I've told you that before, Sandy. And uh, it was a great experience. I had to leave early. My mom died of cancer, uh, and I had to take care of my family as a little 20-year-old kid, and I struggled to pay the rent and stuff. But what really did for me was it built building blocks for me, building blocks to a firm foundation of where I believe my core beliefs started. And when I got to college, I did something terrible. I got disowned. I became a Republican. And uh, <laughs> my family was a long line of Democrats. They still are. Um, constantly getting berated, but it's okay. Um, I still believe in those uh, strong beliefs that I have. Um, I raise my family that way, mm -hmm. and I give them the freedom to do what they'd like to do. I have a 24-year-old, 21-year-old, and a 16-year-old. My 16-year-old girl, she's a handful, but I love her to death, and she's one of those that are probably going to be the next Supreme Court Justice, I hope, uh, if she keeps going the way she's going. I tell you all this to give you a little background on myself so you know that I'm coming before you guys. I'm not some little kid, you know, uh, just coming around the block. I'm 54 years old. Um, I've You're been in law enforcement. Huh? You're a kid. Well, <laughs> you know, I feel like 54, but I feel like a lot older because of all the mileage you got on me from all the things I've been through in my life. Um, the diversity I've faced all those years helped me to grow to where I am right now. So. In the 27 years of uh, law enforcement that I have um, with me right now, I spent 21 of those years in Orlando. During that time period, what it taught me was a bunch of things. It taught me that I never want to be a cop again. No. Uh, <laughs> what it really did show me, though, was that um, I got to go and be diverse in our department. I got to work from riding horses and being on the mounted patrol to, to making kids' lives happy, to working in the school districts over there. I mean, there were days when we would have to pack trucks up, and we all know this, right? I need, I need school to start right now. And the reason why I need school to start right now is I have a lot of kids that rely on breakfast and lunch in our schools. I'm so happy that school free, lunch is free, and you guys did that for us, okay? Because I want that program to keep going. There are kids that don't have any other meal. There are times when we were in Orlando, we would have to pack our mounted trucks up at free to lay. Because we get connections. We meet people in the business of law enforcement, and they would pack our trucks up with snacks and we would ship them. We'd spend a whole 12 hour shift just shipping goods to all parts of the districts that needed it because we knew kids would go home on the weekends and not have it. We started finding that out early. I know that today in our schools right now, in Lake County, we have kids that are starving right now. Kids that will take stuff home and don't have nothing to eat. This is their only source of food for the weekends. So I really need school to start quick. And then during that time period, I got to spend time on chief staff, and that was an awesome experience. We learned how to work budgets. We worked with a $120 million budget in the police department every year, trying to cut corners, trying to make things squeeze a little bit longer here, make a police car last a little bit longer, um, use our tires just a little bit longer, okay? Um, and we do that because we all know the benefit of keeping that money inside the budget and being able to use it to help ourselves later. And so when I'm looking around at um, these large budgets that we're dealing with in the schools, uh, we're going to be probably doing the same thing. I'm probably going to be a little conservative more than some people think. I do though feel that people should be pay, paid fair wages when they're in their, and they're really hurt, uh, uh, working on the front lines. Those are teachers that are out there and are even down to our bus driver. If you've ever had to drive a bus for four hours with 100 kids every day, uh, I'm telling you right now, <laughs> I don't know if you could pay me enough to do that for a whole school year. Me either. Okay. So going from that guy all the way up to our, our principals, that I've seen principals out there 60 hours plus a week, sometimes longer, um, bringing home their work and then coming back in to do their work. Come on. Um, How are you? I a lot more stuff. Okay. Okay. So I do feel and I understand the, the plight of what we're going through in our schools when we're looking at that. I was on the front line, and I do feel like at this point in time, we do need more help when it comes to the psychological being of our kids. They've been trapped for a while. They're going to need help coming back out of it. Um, the counselors are inundated with students that have many problems. There were days when I would spend hours and hours with kids trying to commit suicide. 
talk, talk crying in my office about the pictures that some kid took of them and it's putting them out there on the internet right now and, and um, little girls just destroyed because uh, of this. I know the plight and I know what they face in schools. I also know the business side of things. Huh? I've sat on the school board, I'm sorry, I sat on the board for the YMCA Teen Achievers Program. Um, we help okay. kids to get set up and ready for college right from high school. Well, Currently, I'm sitting on the board for the Lambda Omega yes. Club, which is a club that we started in the Mount Dora Police Department to help athletic yeah. students and to help students with 3.5 GPAs or better go to straight into college. And we help them get scholarship programs. And those are the kind of programs I want to expand throughout the county if I come out here, just to help the principals do that. And we'll find funding for that from a private source, so that we're not just tapping into what we do in the schools. Um, I believe there's a combination of both that we can get some of the private sector to come in and help us. And um, I think sometimes with your connections, especially knowing and we can network, I think we'll be able to do that. So I'll give you a little insight of what I'm about and where I'm coming from and what I want to see this happen in this school year. Um, I will have better numbers for you and better ideas once I'm on board. And I'm going to be a hands-on person because I fully retire in August. And I won't um, have anything else to do. So be a school board member. Uh, it'll be a fishing rod in the back of the truck and a school board member. And that's it for the rest of my life. I appreciate you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. I have a question. Sure. Can I sit down? Um, and I'm not sure how to word it. About um, if going back to school in August, there's three options at this point, I believe. I think uh, school board member Bill Mathias told me the three options are still on the table. How, how do you feel about those options, and what do you feel is the best option at this point? Uh, who wants to go first? Do you want to go the, first, Mike? The state doesn't give them an option so anymore. As a parent, I'm going to speak as a parent. I still have some apprehensions about my 16-year-old going to school. But she's 16, so she knows how to social distance. She knows how to keep her hands clean and washed, and she's more aware. Where, where I have an issue is not the high schools so much, is my elementary schools, where that little guy, like we were talking about before, he's going to be swinging around his mask, he's going to be um, digging in his nose, and he's going to do what kids do. Okay? We see it every day. Um, and that's where I'm having uh, a little issue about them coming back to school a little early sometimes. Because how do we teach them to social distance? How do we keep that uh, going? So it's going to be really stringent. We're going to have to go in and make sure all these kids are sanitized on a daily basis, keep the classrooms maybe zero in. Um, now, we thought about big hoses. That's child abuse. We can't do that, okay? But one of the things that we're look at is trying to help them learn, because we, we can do that. We taught them how to do active drill shooters, active shooter drills, right? They all know when they hear the bell to do a certain thing. They all know when the fire alarm goes off what to do, right? If a hurricane or a tornado comes into our town, they know what to do. Well, let's teach them about how to do what? Sanitize, how to keep themselves clean, how to sanitize themselves. And I think that with, with a lot of training, a lot of problems, we're able to do that. And our school teachers, they're going to have to go ahead and take a step up. Elementary, middle school is really going to have to step up and going ahead and protecting themselves in the classrooms and making sure their their individual classrooms and hallways are protected. Well, in the three options that are there, uh, speaking with a parent last night about that very thing, the, the school board is doing everything possible that we can do to be prepared once school starts back to make sure we have all the cleaning supplies and the safety materials needed to protect our teachers and our staff at the school. The students, if they want to do something, it would be up to them because uh, I listened to a, a telecast that was put on by our lobbyist at uh, Claremont and everything that they got a, a superintendent of a, uh, the fifth largest district and he's out of Florida, but the fifth largest district in the United States for school district had him speaking and, and part of it and he said if they were to try to provide masks for every student in two weeks it would cost them two million dollars. They could not afford to do something like that. So there's other options out there that can be made. But the other thing is uh, the, the different varieties that are out there, the people have even still continued to send emails to us as board members, we want you to wait till after Labor Day. Uh, unfortunately, 
they have not seen the news of late, undoubtedly, where we were told by President Trump, we were told by the governor, we were told by the Department of Education director uh, in, in Florida, if we do not start schools in August, school board members will be removed, the superintendent will take a cut in pay, and it would just go on and on and on and escalate. So we're going to open up in August. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, out of a little bit less than 14,000 students or, or 14,000 parents that have went on and, and did a survey, uh, which in that 14,000 is kind of skewed because do they have just one child, two ch children, or three? So that could be more than 14,000 students. It could be up to even 16, 18,000 as a total. But with what was put across yesterday uh, when I met with the superintendent uh, in my meeting, there was 57% going back brick and mortar. There was 27% that was going to do virtual, and there was others that were undecided out of that group. Now, since that time, some of that 27% that were going to do virtual have changed their mind because they found out that they thought they would pick the teacher they want for virtual from the existing teachers at the schools. That's not how it works. There's a virtual teacher, and that's who would, your child would be assigned to. If you go to brick and mortar, then you have a little bit more levity about who you would like for your child to have as a teacher. So some of them are, are, are jumping ship and going back to brick and mortar. And we'll find out more because for us to make a, a, a quantity, quantified decision as far as what we're going to need staff-wise, we've got to know how many is actually going to show. Uh, so, like I said, we as a board are working together with, and the superintendent is keeping us up to date. And then I also am the representative off the board for the FSBA, which is the Florida School Board Association, uh, because we took that money of the other four members that would normally be on there, and we are utilizing that to pay for lobbyists to go and try to get us funding and change some of the laws in Tallahassee. So uh, I get emails constantly. They're even doing a webinar right now and uh, about the latest update with things and all. But the, the, the other thing is the school board has been taken out of the loop, you might say, as far as, as a designation as, as saying you will or will not wear mask. Uh, as far as the students and the staff, it is now solely up to the local health department as far as the school boards have been taken out of the mix, and I'm kind of glad that way it causes less. We're going to get blamed anyway, but still, it. it doesn't come back on us. So, uh, uh, and I think you might know who the health department head is, or if, if emergency operations centers is here in Lake County, and, and it will be their decision as far as where we do or don't. Uh, and that's a big thing. A lot of parents are concerned. If I send my child back, are the other students going to wear masks? When are they going to be checked for a temperature? We've made arrangements at the schools that there will be an isolation room. If someone comes in with symptoms showing that they have a fever and with the symptoms of the COVID, they will be put in an isolation room, and the parents will be immediately called and asked to come and pick up their child. The problem is a lot of times when parents are called, they don't always come right, right away. Mm -hmm. So someone's got to stay there around that child or that student. Then, once that is done, now we have to vacate that room with the other students they came in contact with and go in and sanitize that room to make it safe for everyone else there. Uh, as I said, we, have, we are providing different things for our staff. We will have masks uh, for the summer to get started with the summer program we have. Those uh, teachers and all, if they would like a shield, would have a shield. And, and I tell you, if you haven't been to Tavares Elementary, they have some cute ones there that their staff for next year, one of their uh, employees there is a relative of someone up north in, in the medical field. and. They send them masks. I mean, they've got ears on it, nose, and stuff like that. It's pretty neat. But, I mean, it's things like that. It makes it where, as he talked about, and I went and read an article from the, it's, it's called the American Academy of Pediatrics, I believe, A AP. And their suggestion, and I even listened, listened to a broadcast here last week, their suggestion is kids go back to brick and mortar. But they highly suggest that they wear masks. Now, the other thing is, we're looking at how many students can we carry on a bus. Right now, they're mm -hmm. saying about 22. A bus that would normally hold 66, now we can only carry 22. And they have to all be facing the front. So, 
uh, and after that bus does that run, then there's got to be some type of fumigation to make sure that the next run that you do, you're not carrying on from one to the other. So there, there's a lot involved. And then every day, there's got to be cleaning done, thorough cleaning in that classroom. So uh, there's a lot of scare, but in reality, uh, when we look back at it, this is things that we've been having for years. It's just this is the highlight of everything right now. And unfortunately, it, as I think you were talking about it a little bit earlier, it started in 68 with different things. If you go back and you look up every major election year, something like this mm -hmm. has come up. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> November 4th. Solomonsky crisis. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as, as I said, I, I will tell you this. We as a board are very much on top of these things, and we have a, a person that is right there with us, and that's Dr. Christy <coughs> Burns. That, that's what her background is, and believe me, she informs us every meeting about what it's, what it's doing and what's available. It's too bad. I'm sorry, but <laughs> well, we know, and of course, a lot of, and I understand parents that have younger children, but they are very unlikely to catch it, or, or they have it and they don't know it because it doesn't do anything. Now, I know we have children of all ages through high school that have certain, uh, maybe have medical. S medical problems. We have a couple that work in here that are in college. And they both have medical problems, and so they wear masks and, and, and shields and stuff. And I, the older teachers are probably the ones that are the most um, vulnerable, Concerned. really. Really good older teachers, uh, I know they would want a shield and all that. But I just, I know you, the parents have to feel comfortable, but <clears throat> I feel that uh, the younger kids, unless they have an un, uh, underlying problem, well, they'll be fine. You is know. that a question now? Well, question? no, I'm just, I, and I want them to jump in and say, no, we got to do this. <laughs> no, no, no. Or well, no, well, well, that's not questions. the way we're going to do I've it. I've heard some teachers um, in, the, in the field now start talking about this. And so what their suggestion is, some of the people that might have some medical conditions that might be affected by this really bad, um, is to start hopping on the virtual school um, mm -hmm. and start looking at yeah. giving them preference. Um, if, and helping them get there so they can start teaching from afar right now mm -hmm. um, and not be that close in that, in that classroom environment. I still, I still think that our high schools are not going to have that much of an issue with our students being so much more mature. I think what we need to see is our special needs classrooms too. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to figure out how we handle that because um, most kids in special needs classrooms, anytime I would go in there to read, um, or play with the kids, man, they were all over me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they never stopped. They just like being around. They love attention and they love that special hands on. So I think that's where we're going to need um, those parents to jump in board and help us to make sure that the symptoms, they catch them early. And I think those teachers can <coughs> do a little bit more personal um, attention to their students to make sure that they don't have it. There's no way we're going to be able to check the temperature of 800 students in a, in a, in a room. Or Leesburg High School, right? 2,000 kids. What are we going to do? I mean, we're going to be putting, putting a, a temperature on everybody. Um, there's no way to keep track of that. So we're going to have to hope that our parents get really educated on this. And, and it's going to be hard, but we're going to have to count on them to help us, too. Well, actually, we are looking at doing temperature checks on every student that comes through our doors to make sure that when they enter they're not sick so that they don't pass it on. Uh, and that's been some of our discussion in our board meetings of how do we do this and how. And uh, then it was also on uh, uh, this committee that have kind of put themselves together that's made up of teachers and some of our staff and the superintendent sits on it. And we as the board, we were allowed to be on there on the Zoom meeting, but we had to stay muted. We were not allowed to talk because of the sunshine law. But uh, we were allowed to listen and listen into some of their concerns. Uh, uh, John Carr, which is our uh, assistant superintendent over support uh, staff, uh, he showed me some, uh, it's, it's like a, a clothing smock that they would wear over and it's very tight knit at here and then they would have gloves that would be available. They can wear a shield or they can wear the mask and things of that nature there. The major concern is like our Lake Hills uh, situation there with those children and we have some of those also at, at our elementary schools and even further up not so much in our high schools because most of those kids uh, that uh, have a, a deficiency 
in their in that kind of situation, they are at Lake Hills. So, uh, but we are doing everything we can to ensure our staff that we're there to protect them as well. Uh, and uh, the the thing is the the government is sending down so much money to do this with and, and to different programs that it's, it's not coming out of our general fund and we're trying to be very cautious of how we spend that so that we are using it to get our best bang for the buck you might say and so that we're presenting a an environment to parents and to the staff we want to make sure we take care of everybody you know and, and the, like you were meaning to earlier about the older generation uh, and like I said that's where like this covering and, and the gloves and the mask or the face shield whatever it takes for us to do to, to ensure there's even been talking about trying to do plexiglass panels and things of that nature there I will tell you in our offices in the front entries there where our clerks is or maybe a secretary in some cases there will be plexiglass shields put across there uh, my understanding they'll be hanging down from the ceiling grids so that uh, it won't be a permanent fixture when this all goes away we'll, we'll be able to take those back down or they may just leave them up as a, just a precaution uh, but there's all kinds of things that we're doing to try to protect everybody but the main thing is and this was uh, he hit it about when you do the, the temperature checks and Julie Lou Allen which is the principal at Eastridge High School has the largest attendance in school for the county and the high school in any school really in Lake County and she's like I can't do this when they get off the bus will we be lined up till after lunch mm -hmm. so it will be set up in an organized way where the each will have a time that and the thing is once they are acknowledged that they do have a fever they'll be automatically isolated and sent to the office to the nurse and then everything will go from there so we're doing everything we can financially and physically to ensure that this goes over. But the thing is, in anything and everything you plan, there's always somewhere that there's going to be a link that's not going to be caught. You know, I know one of the things that I was told also from one of the teachers that they would like to see is maybe due to temperatures for the bus riders um, prior to getting on the bus. And that would help a little bit getting those. But we, I reminded her that we do have a lot of students to get dropped off too. So that's where <coughs> you're right. There's going to be a big, long haul right there them coming through that door trying to get them temperature to also. I want to go back to the bus situation for a moment. The question, um, when you said like 22 kids on a bus, won't the buses have to make multiple runs and how is everyone going to get to school at the same time? And, and see, and <coughs> some of that was devised around where they were talking about mm -hmm. the split sessions and uh, in which that is one of the mm -hmm. options I think it's option three where they would go and they would take their mandatory classes and then the electives they could, you know, if they were in band or chorus or something like that, then they could work that out. But the others they could take it home online with virtual. Okay. Well, in that case, then all those kids are coming to school, but they're going, but they will have to provide their own transportation in that case. Uh, they may get transportation to school, but to get home because they're leaving at midday or whatever. <laughs> They would have to get their own transportation home. But as far as uh, getting there and, and with multiple trips, we don't have enough bus drivers now to make one trip. So it, it's, that's where we're waiting on CDC with our health department and EOC to tell us what are we going to be allowed to do and what we're not going to be allowed to do to be able to make the trips necessary. Because, as I said, we're short of bus drivers as it is. Yeah, you, know, you couldn't pay me enough to be a bus driver. <laughs> Did you have um, your workshop on Monday was call. about the three <laughs> options, was it yes. not? And it's online now? It should be. So we can go look at it. One more question about that, and then we need to switch to more questions. But, you know, you're talking about the bus having 22 students on it, opposed to having 60. So in the classroom with the social distancing, What's happening there? Are they having to hire more teachers to spread out the kids, make adjustments to classroom sizes? You want him to answer that first? I, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to let Mike answer well, that first. I, I've only talked to a few teachers on that, and they're starting to clear out the classrooms to give them more space in there. Um, I know that's that's something they've been told to do and clear out the, the room, be able to spread out the chairs a little bit more. 
but I have not, and I have to be honest, I have not heard anything beyond that. And uh, I'm sure Sandy has um, in being in the workshop, but I haven't heard anything more about just being able to give themselves more space in the classroom and reduce the amount of, I have to say, clutter, because I've been in some of these classrooms before, and there's a lot of clutter that could come out and make the kids a little bit more uh, available to, and easier to clean is the big thing. There, there's a possibility that the spacing could be reduced uh, to a, a lesser distance between. There's also been talk, uh, which was in our workshops, uh, that uh, there has also been talk there as far as, uh, as long as this, matter of fact, if I take, let me edit that back. It was not in our workshop. It was on that uh, Zoom meeting that we were not allowed to speak in, that it was brought out that uh, they are looking at being allowed to actually bring the students closer together as long as they all face the same direction. They cannot interact with each mm -hmm. other facing each other. So therefore that would cause less concern as far as uh, transmitting something there. Uh, so there, there's a lot of things that are going on, but as far as hiring more teachers, uh, where would we put them? That's, yeah, that you was know, the best. And somebody said, well, you could go get portables. Well, uh, <laughs> we still have the same problem with the teachers. I, I have a problem, which we're fixing to, uh, to to after we get through with the Four Corner School and the Lake Mineola High School addition, go to Claremont Middle School, tear that down, and build a new middle school. There was a lot of suggestion from staff there explicitly that they would like for us to keep them on that campus while they we do all that. To bring portables in and the infrastructure that it would cost, because you got to run the electric, you got to run the communications, you got to run this, that, and the other, the plumbing, all these things, would be astronomical yep. rather than us just busing them to another site mm -hmm. for that year to a year and a half, two years that it would take to do all of the demolition and rebuild and then bring them back together mm -hmm. there, utilizing that money where it's best spent is not doing it that way. So bringing in portables right now, there's not enough out there for everyone in the state of Florida to be able to do something like that and be able to have the space. Number one, to various elementary. I, I was the head custodian there whenever we went to Portable City. Okay, because we were tearing down the parts of the existing original building that was built in the 70s when I was in high school and building back to what you see now. We went to Portable City. Well, since we built that and all, they still had to put portables back on site. I was told two years ago that they can't put but one more portable on that site. I'm like, what? We had almost 30 portables here, and we don't have nowhere near that now. But it's because of fire restrictions. Fire codes and things of that nature there, you can't put them together. So what we are doing now is we're going to be building out of prefab concrete, if it's approved Monday night, out of Leesburg, and we would be able to even make a multi-story, that they would be permanent structures, but out of concrete, and we'd be able to make a multi-story where they would be able to do things of that nature there, and not and get out of the leasing business because portables are terrible for energy efficiency, and and I have a major problem with our present county office with all the portables there. We are wasting money as far as I'm concerned, but we, if we were to try to tear. I have a plan that I presented a couple years ago that we rebuild Tavares Elementary on the property we have and then we make Tavares Elementary our new county office. And then we sell that property over there. I was approached Monday about would we be willing to sell that and I said, but he wanted all of it. And I said, you can't take our practice field. <laughs> school. You can have the front part facing the highway as far as I'm concerned. He goes, well, how much do you think we, it would take to build a school? I said, it takes about $40 million to build an elementary school. Oh, well, that probably is not mm -hmm. worth that. I said, it is if you want it. <laughs> so, but it, it, it's all that that comes into play. There's, there's not enough finances to hire the teachers that would need it. There's not enough space on the, on the campuses to do it. And even if we were to try to put portables in, mm -hmm. does anybody know anything about Windy Hill? You know, Windy Hill has a portable for every letter in the alphabet. Oh. Yeah, I know they're they're hard to keep up and they're expensive to run. They have 26 portables plus at Windy Hill, and that's all of their sixth grade class is in portables. Now, something that 
with us going to the concrete, we will be able to do put sidewalks and overhead walkways. But with portables we lease, we're not given funding to put walkways on. We can put sidewalks, oh, yeah. but we can't put covered walkways because they're not permanent structures. So there, there's a lot that comes into play whenever you people say, well, look, portables is the answer. It's not the answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Vance um, just submitted, I think it's two questions here. Vance, is that correct? Well, sort of. follow on to the okay. first one. Um, discuss the pending budget shortfall and how accurate are the forecasts and where would you cut spending to match lower revenues? Get it together with you now, okay? <laughs> well, first of all, we actually don't know totally what our budget is until. Uh, I think Scott told me about it's another two weeks before it would all come out and tell us what we are. The governor has signed and approved uh, for teachers to be moved up in their pay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of teachers are still going to be upset because what he's saying he wants to bring them to, they're not giving enough money like always. So uh, it, it's going to be a little uh, disappointing to some, you might say. And there's a lot of strings attached with the money that is coming down to do that with. But so do you think that you'd have to raise taxes? We're not looking at raising the, taxes. Okay. Uh, first of all, we can't raise taxes. The and school sell board bonds. has well and, and we're not into bonds. And as long as Bill Mathias is on there and I'm on there, we will not do bonds. Uh, because uh, we are already over two hundred million dollars in debt from previous buildings that we built and schools that we rebuilt. And uh, so we're not going to go further in debt. We're going to continue to pay as we go uh, so that we can get out of debt. And that debt won't be cleared until almost the end of 2030. I'm about toward the 2040 years. That's when that debt will actually be cleared off the book. So we're not looking at doing that. But as far as what the budget forecast is for this next year, it's not fully known. But they have said that they will not shut, cut us short on the FTEs of what we got last year. They will not cut us short on that. And, and it just goes on down as far as what they say they won't do. But they haven't told us exactly what our budget is actually going to be that we have to work from. And what was the second part of that question? It was uh, how accurate are the forecasts and where would you cut spending to match lower revenues? Or do you plan to raise taxes, sell bonds that shift the burden to taxpayers? Well, I, I'm not into... Well, we can't raise taxes, and I'm not into the bond issue. Can I explain now. the issue is that it seems like business will react quickly, and they reduce staffing, and they reduce costs. Mm -hmm. They turn off the lights and everything else. But my observation is that during this pandemic uh, that uh, I go to cities, and I went to Tavares and their city, their budget, and they're not recognizing any of these issues of the falling sales tax rates. They predict something, but they, they're they either going to sneak through bonds. Uh, Tavares is still going ahead with a $10 million capital expenditure building, as opposed to saying, let's wait a year. And so the anytime you don't immediately cut your costs to match your current and forecasted revenues, you're building up a liability and you're like spending at a higher level and I've been in companies where they've done that and it cost them millions because somebody thought he knew better than you know what how economics works and and so I get really sensitive about here we have a situation where the economy is dropping and uh, the revenue sources are all down um, everybody's sitting there and hoping that the governor or the federal government will give them more money but then that's coming out of taxpayers, you know, pockets anyway through federal program or state, and I I would like to see some responsible action by government agencies, that rather than just listening to all the whining of employees when everybody around them that isn't working for government, they've been affected, they've been laid off, they got cut, you know, except for maybe getting six hundred dollars extra for unemployment. Yeah, well, they we, cut their budgets. We we took last year. In negotiations with the, the unions and everything, we did not give anyone a raise, per se, which caused us a lot of flack. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing was, uh, the one group 
presented us with some things that they saw that we could make cuts in in departments, and one of them was in transportation. Let's cut their fuel. And my question is, so we, when we run out of fuel for the buses, who's going to pick up the kids? You know. So that you know, the thing is, and then also some of the things that they brought to us as far as making cuts in the departments. Uh, some of the departments, that money can't be touched for that because it can't be transferred into the general fund to give raises to. It can only be used for Title I or ESE or for the capital programs. We can't take impact money and give people raises. We can't take impact money and pay the insurance for the employees. That money can only be used for construction and repairs mm -hmm. and renovations. So there's a lot of things that, that is in the budget that a lot of people say, well, why can't you do this? Well, because the government says it's a little different than you handling your, your well, finances. I know. they got home. all the different pots and they're committed. Okay. But then it's also, called fund counting. Also, yeah. what the superintendent did in planning the budget to go forward this year, she went to all the administration staff and told them, you need to give up. Uh, and, and they went and they surveyed the, the uh, population at the schools for the grade levels and having teachers and all that they had there. And they found out that we actually, through the county, we had 60 teachers above what our population should be. So we, we had classrooms that may have 14 or 15 in it versus having 18 in it. And so whenever you do that, you've got six or seven on that grade mm -hmm. level. Uh, you put all that together. Now you've, you've cut back because you put them where they should be in a class. Uh, and so what was done, she did, is she did the average that you can do. It's not saying that you can only have 18 in, in this certain grade. You can only have 18 in this class's max you can have. It's that you take that grade level and you can only have an average of 18 all the way across the board. So it works out that way. So cuts are being made in that department as far as teachers and it went, you know, well, you're, here you are, you're cutting teachers. Well, the thing is, if we're overpopulated in that situation, then we need to make adjustments. And so the superintendent, is, and along with her staff, are going through and seeing where else they can make adjustments, knowing that we could more than likely have a shortfall in finances, as Vance talked about, as far as the local tax revenue coming in. Now, as far as the other part of that is your property taxes. You know, everybody knows that went as far as the revenue came up. You know, the property taxes didn't go up, but the revenue came up. So, but that's money we cannot use in the general fund. So, has anybody done any calculations on how much money has not been spent that usually would be spent, like on electricity in these schools, water bills in these schools, um, the bus situation? Certainly, not any gas was used for months. And even if some was used, it was at a much lower rate. In, in transportation, I asked about that situation there in their mm -hmm. budget. I said, so with the fuel costs, we didn't have to expend in transportation. Well, Sandy, you got to understand, fuel fuel goes up. What we were spending for and, and paying to, to buy it last year, that's going to go up X amount per gallon. When school starts back, we, we've got to, we just can't go spend that money just because we didn't spend it last year. But there is savings there, and that money rolls over. Anything that is not used rolls over into the next budget. Uh, and what I presented last night when asked about what the budget is, if you go back and you pull that final budget of 2019 that was presented, you would see that it says over here in this column 687 million, but up here at the, when it gives you the review it tells you 703. So I asked the question, where did that extra 16 million come Hello. from? Well, it's where money rolled over into the new budget and it was put into that. But the thing is, no one is actually going through and saying, this is how much we saved on this. We really don't know there because we still had to keep the, the chillers going to make sure that the classroom stayed mold-free, things right. of that nature there. Uh, the lights didn't have to go on, but we used a very high energy efficient lights in our school system as it is now. Uh, some of the questions that I've had, and Vance brought a good pro, uh, a, a thought up, is cutting lights on and off. Every time I drive by to various high school at night, I'm like, why are all these lights on? Mm -hmm. Seriously. Why, why now these exterior sidewalks, why are these lights on? And our local law enforcement it says they would rather there be no lights than lights. And we're like, why? You'd be able to see somebody on campus if there's lights. He goes, we can see people on campus if there's no lights because they've got to have a light to see where they're going. So it's more obvious of what's there. So, you know. Do you have some input on that? Just that 
I think that um, you guys brought up some good points in the fact that we've saved some money over the past couple of months because of this, but and we do have some funds set up for emergencies, and we do have some extra funds set up for uh, catastrophes, and, and this may be one of those times when we have to tap into some of that. But one of the things that we have to do is really trim a lot on, as far as even Sandy brought it up, we have to trim a little bit more on making sure that our staffing needs are there. But it's just not staffing. It's also what expenditures are happening at the schools. And everything. everybody asked the same question, because I was asked the same thing, well, are we going to give raises Okay, we can, but that money has to be earmarked for that. And there's earmarked money for other parts of the of our schools right now. We can't pull that funding as he was bringing up. And I think that I think our unions and our people that are asking for that know that they're just trying to see what they can do for us. Um, for me, right now, I feel like I would like a little bit more information before I make decisions on how we're going to be readjusting the budget um, for the following year coming up, especially after this big, big uh, area of taxes that we're losing. I know Mount Dora and Tavares and Eustis, we do count on some tourism tax. We do count on people coming and staying in our towns and visiting, and we've seen the reduction in that. So. I have another question, and I don't know if I'm going to ask this right. You don't have to take this, fans. Um, You know, every year <laughs> these students start getting panic in, right before Christmas because as soon as they come back, they're going to have to be focused on nothing but testing. And that didn't happen this year. And, uh, you know, I have grandchildren, and they were so happy. I mean, they were just so happy they didn't have to spend the next half of the year preparing to take these tests. And they actually learned more at home doing virtual schooling because of the shutdown. So my question, I guess, would be, since you have not done the testing this year, how is that going to affect your placement in classrooms with the children? Are they at grade level? Or do you start all, day one preparing them again to take these tests that they just get very panic-stricken about and not actually learning the fundamentals of learning for their grade? All I know is at this point right now, our, our stu students and our kids in our schools right now are nine weeks behind. They have to play catch up. And I know that some of our kids are going to come back to school in panic, uh, but uh, we do have good teaching staff out there that know what we're going to be doing with them to help them get through the next nine weeks of school that they missed. They're going to have to make that up in the same semester um, that's coming up, and it's going to be hard on them because of, of this, what we did early on. Um, so but, we're starting behind already. And what, no, we're not going to start behind. We're just going to catch up. So that's going to be the difference. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't want to discredit what he said, yeah. but I'll tell you, we're not behind. Okay. We, we've stayed. The teachers have stayed on top. The students are on top. And they are ready to move to the next level. As far as the testing, Tallahassee has not decided yet what they're going to do this coming year for testing. But the thing is, uh, they like to use that to grade our schools, whether we're A, B, C, D, or F. I get that. You know? oh, okay. So, and then that's how also funding comes down at times as well. But our, our kids are right on where they're, they're, they're need to get back to brick and mortar, though, because of where they can have that continuity with the teacher and things of that nature. Because sometimes kids need a little bit more attention and they can't get it if it's online. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, but I will tell you, some teachers that know their students have made themselves available offline mm -hmm. to allow personal intervention with the parents, knowing what's going on, not trying to do it behind their back, trying to help these students. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter teaches, uh, a, she's a virtual lab facilitator at Umatilla High School. What her responsibility is, the kids that are lacking the, uh, the GPA to graduate, is to get them back on track so that they would be able to graduate their senior year. And when she first took over that, uh, she had some situations there where this one student said, I'm just, I don't, there's no reason for me to stay. I, I'm not never going to get it. She asked him to give him her two weeks. In two weeks, she was able to start showing him a progress that he was making to go toward that path, and he graduated. So the thing is, the kids are getting the maybe not as much as some people think they should get, but the teachers are giving extra and extra. 
I will say this, the ones that are dedicated. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, okay. I know um, our granddaughters, they, their teachers were readily available to them any time. They would, you know, could pick, their mother could pick up the phone and talk. So I, I do agree with that. And, and I just want to say one real quick thing to that. <coughs> to it is, uh, Dwayne Weeks and Emily, Dr. Emily Weisskopf, took their spring break. That's great. To take and put the programs that we have together for our teachers when they came back from spring break that they could hit the ground running. They gave up their spring break, worked day and night trying to get all this compiled and making sure. Dwayne has worked uh, head over heels, I guess you might say, trying to make sure that they have all the the integrated software that they need and all the the uh, hot spots. We've, we've bought hot spots. The Educational Foundation has donated money for the Chromebooks and the hot spots and things of that nature. So, uh, and I asked a question the other day, are we going to be one-to-one -one when we start PAC? We're not going to be very far away from being one-to-one. -one. Every student will have a Chromebook availability. And those that will be doing virtual at home, I asked the question, what is there if they don't have internet? We are working on the hot spots to make sure that they would have what they need. So we, we're not losing ground. In other words, we're, we're just keep on gaining ground. When we first started, we did not have 100% into the program. We only had about 80 to 85% into the program onto the extended learning. But once everybody caught on, boom, it's there. The one thing that happened, and I'll, I'll hush up to this, one thing that happened is seniors thought that they would not have to continue. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they found out, hey, uh, you didn't finish this, this, and this, so you're not going to walk. What? So, I mean, they were, even some seniors were working the night before graduation, <coughs> and even right up to graduation, to get their documents done so that they could walk. So, I got a question for you guys. We're operating under our current budget. First question is, are, are we on plan with that? And the second question is, all of this mitigation expense for this COVID, COVID, have the feds provided the funding also for the rest of the year? They are providing. Okay, we are on task with our budget that we have now that we're not overdrawn anywhere. Okay. Okay. Uh, because as Vance brought out about some savings and things of that nature, never because we're not having to use money here and there. So we're, we're looking good on that. Uh, we are being given money. Also, there's called a CARES Act. So like that, that, that was the first one? That was the first one yeah. that came out with? Right. Yeah, and then there's another one since that. Okay. But the CARES Act is for like employees. If something happens while they're on the job, that they would be covered uh, the first uh, two weeks or ten days of working days they would have to go out, but if they continue to show the illness in, then that other part of that would come in. So, because uh, the big question was, are we going to have to use our vacation days if you're 12-month employees, or are we going to have to use our sick days if we're 10-month employees? You, you don't have to do that. You're covered under this CARES Act. There's other funding that's being given also that, that covered this as far as that, uh, so that we have the proper materials that we need for safety. Some of that comes out of that. So we're being budgeted money to put things together to pre prevent things happening on our campuses with this. So it's not having to come out of the general fund. Gotcha. Okay, that's good news. I, I will say something on our reserves. Well, it's good news, okay. bad news. It's still our borrowed money from other places yep. at the federal level. On our level. reserve, we have a reserve. We really don't have a catastrophe reserve. We have a reserve. And from that reserve is where we gave bonuses this year to the employee. So it went from a four point four point percent down to about a three point two five percent. And so that's what we're trying to build back up. We want to maintain a four percent. If we go below three percent, Tallahassee comes in and says, What's your plan of action? Get you back up. She had one. Okay. Oh, I was you go ahead, Marie. My question is, as a school board member, what can you do to ensure that programs such as the 1619 Project do not get into Lake County schools? You as a parent, and somebody told me, tell Marie Dubois she needs to be on that committee, whether she's got kids in school or not. Tell what her is she the needs committee? Be, it's a, the curriculum committee that goes around as far as, and it decides what we allow into our schools, the books that we allow and everything. We have parents involved. 
in some cases grandparents, uh, and we have staff involved and they go through and they look at the curriculum. And all this also comes to the school board and it's all advertised as what we're doing before we approve it. So people have a right to come and look and view it. It's put out there to be able to be read or whatever and see that we're doing. How well is it advertised to the general public because I would people... tell you it's done by law, but it's also done on our website. Yeah, you know, that's fair. Okay, but yeah. you have to go to the website yeah. to see it. I mean, it's not like in the daily commercial. No, where... no. This that. isn't new for Marie. She has been doing this for years to try to get good curriculum and things in our schools. Yes. And we had to go and buy the books for our heritage of the United States and buy them and put them in schools because we couldn't get past the school board. Just well, the school right. board did let us put us in there, but they don't you can't get back to the books and get back to the real America. But as far as keeping that out as a board member, if it's not, but that's where I say as individuals that are on this committee, they bring that to us. And then other people, as they see that, like especially like Vance, will bring it to our attention. And, you know, some people say, well, he's always this. But I tell you, he has a lot of good ideas mm -hmm. and a lot of I good know points. That. That he brings. And I'm not hey, saying that because he's Vance. Say that again. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is, you bring that to the attention of the board, and then the, I, I do my homework. Yeah. I just don't take and see something. And, and sometimes they get upset with me when we have meetings that it's just individual board members with the superintendent and, you know, to talk about the agenda. And they're like, oh, here he goes again. But, you know, okay. I, I, I'm asking where is this money coming from? How is it being used? And all? why are we doing this? Why are we using this curriculum? I was told by this parent that this curriculum don't work. Right. And one of it was that, uh, and I, I can't think of it, their offspring of ingenuity. But it was for our younger age group kids, elementary kids, they were using that. And it was something that ingenuity put together on the streamlining online. And there were some problems with it. And I asked, I asked Emily, I said, what's up with this? And she said, believe me, every time we have a problem with it, we send it right to them because they're trying to take the kinks out of it. I said, well, I've got relatives that have called me, text me, emailed me, and said, we do not understand this second grade English. And they're a college-educated, yeah, smart I don't, I don't kids. know about ingenuity. I do know that, like, Scholastic, those um, mm. newsletters and stuff yeah. that go out, they are so biased against the United States and yeah. so I, I'm, All I'm also in this position where I feel that we have a good curriculum set up currently right now um, everything can be improved um, and we can't I don't like to reinvent the wheel I like I like to take what we have currently and massage it and make it a little bit better um, I don't feel like this 16 uh, 19 book that we're coming in should be part of our curriculum um, it could be a periodical I, I don't have that problem in our libraries. I think that constitutionally we should be eligible to read um, information on all sorts of levels. And I, I think that's, that's something that kids could do on their own. Parents can take it in, um, bring it to their attention if they want to and use it. But You're changing, talking about in the school library? Right. Yeah. I, I, and again, it has to be on approval list. Um, and that's something we would approve, but, but not part of a curriculum. That's a different story there. Right. But it's 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 propaganda. It's twisted. Right, That's right. right. It's a twisted. Uh, uh, well, and there are statutes that talk about literature in the schools, as far as obscenity and inappropriate, inappropriate age, age level inappropriate. And we have found books that are in Lake County schools that are on a list of inappropriate. Um, yeah. Yeah with sexual inappropriate... I just want to share an experience with you. Seeing, or go, go ahead, Marty. I just want to... Um, it's been brought to my attention with um, the kids not being in school, the psycholo negative psychological impact on them. What can we do as a community to help with that, especially when they go back to school? Because I know some of the kids in my complex have told me their parents and their grandparents are driving them crazy. <laughs> but um, there's been a negative work, work, work. Send the parents from to the school. child psychologist. I think number one is this, that especially in the elementary, uh -huh. is where they're, okay, it's too loud in here. These kids are going to be so overwhelmed by seeing their friends that yes. there's going to have to be some leniency yes. as far as them 
coming back and recognizing each other and things of that nature there and, and catching up on lost time. Now, From granted, six feet apart. <laughs> now, granted, a lot of these kids have been on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and so they've been keeping up, but I, I think there's going to have to be some leniency given on that part to make sure that they're allowed to, to come back together because that's what they're missing. They're missing that. They're missing horsing around, recess, playing with each other, and it's good for them and emotionally. Was, go ahead. Yeah, and I know a lot of a lot of the teachers in our district here, in District 4, are ready for that, and they've okay. been preparing for that. Okay. And um, even even some of the administrators are making sure that their, their staff knows, hey, when you come back in, be a little bit more lenient on staff as far as them in the classroom, in the cafeteria, even with their school and classwork, they're going to be a little bit more lenient to get them just started. You know, it's just like any kind of engine we have, right? You can't start that engine and run it right away. we got to warm it up a little bit. And the older we get, we need to warm up a little bit more, right? But that's one of the things that, like you were saying, they are going to have to get used to and give them a little bit more leniency. And our kids have been keeping up with each other. Um, we have a totally different type of networking in our schools now. Um, Snapchat and, 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 uh, and it is probably one of the biggest ones they have out there. They are on that 24-7. They know everything that's happening. They, they have everything from TikTok uh, competitions, Chinese. right? Yeah, TikTok about the Chinese. Is Chinese. Yes. But I'm talking about and those younger ones like the, like the physical. Yeah, being like outside. our babies. Yeah. Well, being I, I tell you, a lot of that has to do with the teachers yep. right. and the administration. I, I know the uh, a lot of the elementary administrators, they think outside the box. I teach, and, I teach elementary kids age Sunday school, so... Well, they, they think outside the box at their yeah. local school. So they do different things uh -huh. that gets them more involved and oriented back into the school system to make them want to stay there and, and come back. Uh, there's a lot of uh, teachers that think outside the box, and, and the problem is with the, the distancing that we met, they may not be as, able to do as much as they used to do mm -hmm. to make their classroom more... Uh, want to be there versus that this is what we got to do because of distancing so uh, but yeah it, it has to do with staff all throughout and we also have psychologists at every school okay, we that's we, too bad <laughs> well um, actually that's a good thing um yeah. in in the past we've not had enough i know you're joking but in the past we've not had enough not no, not, no, she's not 100 percent <laughs> and we've and we've also um had a problem where our guidance counselors end up doing the counseling, and then we have um, our, our administrative staff starts helping in the counseling section. Um, uh, let me tell you right now, your school resource officers, work as <coughs> counselors, we're all crisis trained, and so we go in, and that's one of the things that we also do is to help. And we're going to have a lot of those kids come back with issues. There, that's why I said school needs to start right away. I'm going to be honest. As a parent, I want school to start, but as an, a school resource officer out there, an administrator in the schools. I can tell you right now, there are students that are being abused at home right now, and they need to come back. This is a safety net for them. This is a place where they can come and not um, feel unsafe, and our schools need to be open. I know. I have some children that come to my Sunday school. Well, we're, we're going to reopen again, but there's a couple of them that they come to church, and they tell me they feel safe. They're away from the bad environment right. at home. But Now, will the schools... Will they be allowing volunteers to come and volunteer like they used to, or will they? Be? It's going to be on a local basis, that I think. Um, they're going to still have, they'll still have some some mm -hmm. parent volunteers, but you'll have to go through your local school to see if yeah. you can get on that list. We've been advised against it uh, because of what they can bring to the campus. Yeah. So try to limit it to to staff uh, as as far as that because. You don't want to someone come in as a volunteer and not be aware of what they have. So, uh, but we we've been advised against it. So seems you, like you'd need volunteers the, more than ever. Marie and I have participated in some of the curriculum instructional material, both challenges mm -hmm. and reviews, <laughs> and the system is rigged <laughs> in favor of the district, in favor of the state. And in favor of the teachers. Now these guys will will formally sit down with you and spend time with you and and listen to your salesmen or the 
uh, if you no, challenge. the district staff, like okay. in the or, office. Or at a school. We've challenged mm -hmm. at East Ridge. Yeah. The book depository and, staff. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they'll listen to your comments, spend as much time with you as you, as you want, but you're outvoted and the system is rigged against you because the, the room is stacked with either teachers or department heads or district reps. Mm -hmm. and, and they all have their justifications for why, why this defective product it exists. And to, for one or two people, citizens to overturn that generally does not happen. Even the principals mm -hmm. will not. Oh, yeah. yeah, when we went in and challenged this one, it, this is one of the places I find the most egregious is the supplemental material that the teachers get online. You know, they're supposed to teach standard five, six, and seven, so they go to the computer and they Google Florida standard five, six, and seven, and it pops up this um, sheet for the kids. And they hand it out, and the kids look at it, read it, and answer questions from it. And um, it's nonprofit. Propaganda. Yes, it's a yeah. it's a nonprofit left communist. I'm going to say communist socialist yes. agenda, yes. and it's right there on the bottom. It's right there written. This is the author of this. Yeah. And and that information is presented digitally. I think little controls. I mean that. When you have digitally, digital articles that are presented on a daily basis and manipulated on a daily basis for teachers to access. Entire websites. Entire yes. websites. I mean, and the opportunity for mischief there and how anyone can control that, put standards in place that meet our clearly defined statutes. It was at 870, whatever it is that outlines what history is and what outlines what literature is. And then you get into the sciences, which are inundated with this same propaganda in their, in their materials. They embed the, the liberal viewpoint, and that's mm -hmm. it, documented from many different places. And I guess the big issue, and I brought up in public input periodically, is that the, the, I keep asking for the superintendent and the board come up with a mission statement that says we are going to have a values oriented um, and you know I'm just in general terms right now but there's a there's a whole body of knowledge out there about the uh, indoctrination that's included in the textbooks mm -hmm. I tracked it through for the sections on Islam right. where they're actually telling them how to do the prayer oh, yeah. and then they're having them do it in class in some places now haven't found a lot of evidence that it's not like uh, prevalent Lake here. Lake County is better than most in remember, all of these. When I first, we're, we're grateful I remember for. when you brought that to the When I first came in, you had your uh, roadmap for the classes for, I think it was 6th grade and 11th grade for history. And both of them, they said they're going to allocate three weeks to the Islam chapter. And chapter, and Islam had an entire chapter magically in both books. And they were going to allocate three solid weeks to that stuff and then there was nothing on Judaism and there was hardly anything on Christianity now the staff he's talking about the last time I went in there they spent a lot of time and said oh we got this and they had a sheet and here's a quote here and here's a paragraph here and they really worked the system and I'm telling you that the, there's several independent groups like one out of Texas that's now come and review the textbooks here in Florida and others and they find all this garbage in it and it, and you keep and all we'll say like it's common core and the teachers and the staff will say oh it's only uh, common core is only a reading and uh, what English was well, English yeah. ESL and math yeah. and so but the thing it's is they embed it in the textbooks because both of the major textbook companies you use are partially owned by Arabic interests, okay? And I researched it all the way back to how uh, the one um, uh, Muslim country took over, uh, did a, a behind-the-scenes takeover of the publisher, 
because uh, it was a publisher that was actually famous but headquartered in like Belgium or somewhere and they took them over and my the question is that I've never seen the board take a statement on values to uh, which you might call Christian values or just American values right and to and to start excluding telling teachers to exclude that because they're stuck with these textbooks because there's only three maybe for history and so forth three on publishers. the state approved well the state approved list and that's what they have to choose from right. and so they'll you'll sit there and they'll say well we just we picked the, the, the least worst one you know and but you need to have some values I think to coincide with uh, the county and, and, and you know what I call American here's, values. Here's one of the questions that didn't make it last night mm -hmm. number three right Yep. which is a solution to that and would be a good question for you guys. Uh, we, I know we're getting close to the end. Yeah. 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 Go, go. I don't get with the question. Here, Andy, you read it. Uh, read it? Okay, here, yeah. here, here's one. This is important. It, it's one that we didn't make, that well, we didn't get to. challenges? No. Or is that one that's different from what y'all sent out on the yes. questionnaire? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's different, it's different. Marie came up with it. Well, we've used it in other candidate yeah, forums and other cycles. There is a. There are currently Florida statutes requiring historic accuracy and preventing inappropriate literature in schools. However, books and supplemental materials are currently used in our district that are historically biased, that don't comply to the statute, or incomplete, or literature that is offensive, doesn't comply to the statute, especially sexual content that is not age appropriate. Would you, candidates, be in favor of com a compliance audit and citizen review, if deemed appropriate, of these instructional materials. Just to see that these instructional materials comply to statute. It's 870 something. And there's 1003. And there's 1003. One. It's just, so these are statutes that everything downstream through the Board of Education and mm -hmm. it's the district meets these. See, my thought is like you guys look at NEOLA, is it? to make sure that you're in compliance with all the new laws and stuff and perhaps we should do something like that with you know the history the and the liter yes and yeah. make sure that you're I would in volunteer compliance. to be one of those citizens yes. on that audit as long as you're not outnumbered by staff yeah <laughs> well the AP program is well, another yeah. one that's just yeah. riddled because the guy running it is the guy who founded Common Core and he moved over there, and so he's directed all their tests to be in alignment with the Common Core and all the things that that uh, we consider to be indoctrination. And I'm just a values guy. I mean, they're, they're, forget the religious issues. It's just it's uh, anti-history and other things. Anti-Americanism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the question. Is uh, and so maybe we could have the police uh, experience to share. <laughs> His thought, because he's now been ambushed with his question. Yes, yeah, I was yes. Gonna say, come on. Um, so, so, on one of the things that we need to look at is, I, I kind of agree with you. Having a little citizens review, um, just to give us more information and more insight, um, sitting as a board member would help. Um, and I, I agree with saying that maybe you guys won't be outnumbered, and we can get some real facts from you guys, and be able to present a, a really good argument when it comes to some of this. Um, and I talked to you this before, right, uh, about the religion. I sat in the civics class, and they did talk about religion. I didn't see the teacher concentrate three weeks on Islam. Um, there was a question proposed to me before about Muslims in the schools, and I said, no, 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 it's Islam. It's what they're teaching, just like they're teaching Judaism and Christianity in the schools. And they're oh, yeah. using that as a religion. They're using that religions of the world. That's all they're talking mm -hmm. about. They're not teaching about the subject. They're just telling you and informing the students that there's religions in the world. And that was in a civics class I sat. And I thought that was a good idea because as Americans, sometimes we become a little focused on ourselves and we forget that the world exists and there's different um, areas and different religions out in the world that we need in customs. And I've traveled around the world. I've been to Morocco and walked the deserts with some um, Biron people. And I've been to you know Israel and been in, the, in, in different parts of our countries, uh, different parts of the world, and seen religions from those and respected them. Because as Americans, that's what we need to do. As Americans, respect those people in those areas. So. See, I would argue that we have gone overboard yes. 
respecting other religions and other countries, other cultures, well, when we go into their as country, opposed to Americans. When we go to their country, we need to learn to Well, that's that. fine, and but that's we're talking we're about in this country. country. We're, talking we're, we're talking about flat out indoctrination yep. in the history books. I've documented yeah. it. Yes. I've got 140 snapshots of those sections in the books. Yeah, and that's and, something uh, I would love to see also. And that, it's up on my So you're on our committee too, Vance. There you go. Sure. I'll come in. So get three I think you need right to now. develop some standard values, though, as I to agree. what's acceptable and what exactly. isn't. Exactly. Just agree. an audit. Just an audit. Say, that, see, that this is the as is. That's all. And, and I don't have a problem with that because, uh, number one, with my position I have, not as a board member, as a pastor, I'm very much about values. And the thing is, what you brought up, we have gave too much to where we have put, where we can't, our kids can't say a prayer here, but yet they can. Yeah, right. I don't you understand know? that. And right. so how is it right for them, but wrong for us? Well, the culture is way ahead of us on this. That's constantly, yep. so, uh, constantly bombarded. You have a moment of silence at a school board meeting, and yet the, it's not allowed in the classroom. And, and see, when I took over to planning and zoning as chair, uh, right now we have continued because before I make a change, I want to make sure the rest of my committee is on. But the previous before me uh, took away the prayer, even a moment of silence. Yeah, I remember away. that. Away. <laughs> and some of our panelists, our board up there on the planning and zoning says, what happened to our prayer? So since I've been back on, I have initiated a moment of silence. Good man. You know, but I, I don't have a problem with saying a, a, an oral prayer. You know, mm -hmm. uh, right. Because to me, it acknowledges what I stand for, and I stand for Christianity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and if I offend someone, you you have the right. To, you can go outside while we do this, and you can come back in after we get through. Uh, but this is how we. This is our country. This is how right. we were done. Yeah. But if you do yeah. it now, there will be somebody come up, and they will. Offer a lawsuit. Yeah, a lawsuit or something. Just because keep... I've even made a comment about why can we not actually say a prayer at our school board member meetings, mm -hmm. and they said, well, because you will be sued like crazy. Yes. That's but, crazy. okay, That's well, come crazy. on. So then yeah. you get Anthony Sabatini to represent you. <laughs> Pro bono. I don't know why. He'd love to. It, it's, yeah. but I don't you want to speak for him, but I'll bet you he would have to him. allow people from different religions do that. And that's what right. they the do the cities and the county. Mm -hmm. yeah. The county has done. Also the city of Tiberias. When mm -hmm. I was on mm -hmm. council at Tiberias, yeah. there would be times that a minister was not available and Nancy Barnett would say, hey, or the mayor at that time, who it might be, or even if I was mayor, if there was no one there, I would say the prayer <laughs> and we would do it verbally and then we would move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. And the county, they initiated that. But one thing that the county did and really, it's kind of in the city as well. You're not supposed to say the word Jesus. Yeah, I don't understand that. You know? And uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't take no thought about what I'm going to say. I say it. Right, right. It's automatic. Well, I acknowledge Jesus Christ. But as long as, as long as you allow, like, a Jewish person and to they say do. a prayer, that's... They do. But then you've got to allow the imam well, to... Our, but... our chaplains are all the same way. We have chaplains that are... are, are actually rabbis, and we actually have chaplains that are from the Baptist Church and from other different, uh, the Catholic Church, and that's what they do. They're, they're, I want to say when they do a prayer, it's a generalized prayer, because we all believe in God, and one God, right? So, um, and that's, that's how I feel that our students should be allowed to do the same thing. I'm never going to stop a kid from sitting down and praying before they eat lunch. Right. That, that's, that's not A, a staff nice. member cannot interact with a right. student body and lead them in prayer. Mm -hmm. So, so students are, but you don't stop them. So either, students are allowed to give to say a prayer and give thanks for their food at lunchtime. It's not, a personal not belief. always, and, and like Kelly has it, but you just turn to. Uh, I know in pray. California, they students can get suspended for yeah. saying a prayer in school. Okay. Are That's we crazy. doing a pledge of allegiance in classrooms? In every classroom. Mm -hmm. We have one every yeah. morning. And in most cases, it's a telecast broadcast. Right. Okay. Uh, the there and there's someone that's doing the announcements, and they lead. They have a moment of silence, and then they lead in. Oh, prayer. they do have a moment of silence. They have a moment of okay. silence, and they lead in the pledge of allegiance. Let's give you guys a couple minutes just to talk about yourselves, and you know, again, what you see the school board going forward if you're reelected or elected, and maybe some of your most important issues that 
are the most important to you? Who wants to start? It's me. Yeah. Okay. Well, as being reelected, I want to continue what we've been doing as far as going forward with our graduation rates and our, our dropout reductions going down and continue moving forward in that, and the superintendent presented a program in 2018 that goes through 2022 to try to keep our curriculum going the right way, to keep our grads going the right way, and, and all these other things that's been added. Since that time when that was done, the .75 millage came out, which allowed us to be able to hire guardians for the schools, the sheriff's department, or the police department to uh, pay for their officers to be at schools. Uh, we don't have a guardian, I was told, at every school but we have a, a resource officer or a deputy at every school in Lake County. And in some cases, we do have a guardian plus there. Uh, we're trying to do that all throughout the county. Uh, I think I was told that we have over 50 guardians in Lake County. And we have others that are going through the courses. And as I said before, we allow administrators to go through the course to become certified as well. One of the biggest things we're facing this next year is the is this pandemic, how we're going to get started with it. What has been issued to us is, is only good for the fall. Once the fall is over, they'll re, in between, they will reevaluate and tell us what we can do for the winter months. But we're looking to go forward with that. Uh, as far as our finances, uh, we will be having workshops here in the next weeks to discuss what our finances are. Scott has already been putting things together to try to get it going but to let us know what we will have to work with and what we won't have to work with. Uh, and we haven't heard specifically back from all teachers how many are going to retire or how many what. But there's only so much room in the virtual, and we're looking at adding one allocation only right now to the virtual because of the amount that is said to be slated to go there. So we're not looking at a lot of swing on that. So we're looking at a lot of brick and mortar teachers still being there, those that want to be there. Uh, there's not the thing is if they choose not to be there because of health reasons then they yeah you know, they choose not to do that but uh, uh, we are moving forward uh, as I said I 22 years I've worked for the system behind the scenes and support staff as I, I made a comment last night when you build a building you got to start with a footer and a foundation I'm the footer and foundation part of the board our board has different representatives there I only make up 20 percent of it but I'm some people say you're the weak link because you have no college degree. Well, actually, I actually have nine semester hours. Okay, but that nine and semester. Neither does Bill Gates. And, and that, <laughs> nine, that, that nine semester hours is because I, I coached high school sports, and they would only give you a two year certification, and then you had to go and get this nine semester hours if you want to continue coaching in high school. And I do. Uh, I coach with my daughter right now at Umatilla High School softball. I don't get paid because I can't get paid to do it, but I volunteer. I do a lot of groundwork up there on that softball field and get it prepared. Luckily, there's a guy volunteer now, so that's taking some of that pressure off of me. But uh, there's a lot that I do. I, I, I don't just show up for meetings. I, I sit on four different boards plus an allocation board for the Lake County School System within itself, and I'm very proactive on that. Uh, this year we did not have a meeting because I had some things I wanted to bring up in it and you know we didn't have a meeting because of this so they said well, we're just going to go with what we did last year except we're going to make cuts in teachers because we are consolidating classes to make the percentage rather than like it is right now so they cut 60 positions in teachers uh, but the thing is in all of this what makes me eligible to be a board member I have a heart and soul for Lake County Schools. I have three great kids that are still in the system. One, he'll be a sophomore this year. One will be in seventh grade, and one, she's going in third grade. I have an investment in that. And somebody said, well, you're not in for raises. You're not one to give us raises. I have a, a wife and a daughter. Both work for the Lake County School Systems. And believe me, if there's any way possible that we could come forth to give raises, I would give raises. But there's no way we can guarantee, and as, as Vance pointed out about the, the finances going into this next year, that's why we could not give raises last year because we're not sure how much money we're going to have yeah. to start with. Yeah. And with the tax mm -hmm. revenue not being like it, sales tax not being like it would be, we're going to lose revenue there. So, and so where do we get those finances from? Well, the government is, is chipping in some, but as always, the government doesn't always chip in. 
Something I'd like for you to also consider is, and this is something that we have brought up at the school board workshops, not so much in a meeting, but in a workshop, and that is, it's called a compression adjustment. Mm -hmm. Two years, a year ago, we got $2.8 million. This past year, we got $2.6 million. The average that we should get annually is $20 million. For what? To help break the difference up of what the government gives, the state gives us, and what our local effort gives us to help bring what we should get per student. The compression adjustment and the compression adjustment. Oh, man, I thought you were talking about teacher salaries. No, sir. Okay, that's but, okay. but this, but this maybe also, you ought to explain then what you mean. By the compression that. adjustment. If you go to ten point or ten eleven point six two, it details compression adjustment. But what it really is in entail with is we don't have enough industry or commercial revenue coming in in taxes mm -hmm. that we would get what other districts. We're like six, 59 or 60, I forget, out of 67 counties on per student that we get on that. There are counties that are smaller than us, but because of what they have in their county, they get more per student. Where are we, we on number of students? Where do we rank on number of students? We're the 19th largest okay. district in the state of Florida out of 67. And we get paid. Yeah. Get and You're talking about the big spreadsheet that Bill Mathias mm -hmm. made. Yes, okay. the compression mm -hmm. adjustment that he showed. In all the years, if you go across, now if you take that $20 million a year, and it started out less earlier, but as it progressed and it should have been in the last three years, $20 million a year, that's $60 million, and we've only got 5.4. That's a a lot of money that could have been in us into our revenue. Also, our reserve would have been where we needed to be. At so that's money you never got. That's money we never received. And see, the thing is, we get getting hit by unions about, well, you are getting this, you're getting that. You're getting a cost of living for all the teachers and all that come down. Okay, where? Let, let me clarify yeah. just what he's talking about right. is that the, all the counties. You know, there's a pot of money, and they allocate it with this big, huge, absurd formula. And our county gets less than what our taxpayers put into the entire it's pot. It's one million. It's yeah. one mil. And so it's, it's not returning all the money that our people put into it because a lot of it is going to the urban cities, and they've had fights constantly trying to get them to relinquish that basically an overpayment to them. Well, they have more reps and, and right. senators in the yeah. legislature. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the, the issue. Is the reason uh, we have school choice is because someone's student or their child, I should say, did not get to go to the school they wanted to for athletics. The next thing you know, we have school choice. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> I mean, I mean it's but it's fortunate that we have Fortunate that we got it, but how we got it is. It's very good. So. It's working really bad. To, yeah. yeah. So, um, for me, it's going to be basics, what I'm standing for, the AXE program. I want to go back and try to get students, especially kids, right from elementary school into the right reading programs, into the right areas, so that their academics will grow and they will see better student-taking tests better examples of our students graduating and going to our different levels of colleges and vocational schools. Um, to me, that's something that we possibly can do here. Um, I know there's a lot of students graduating today that don't want to go to college. Um, they want to stay in the vacation area. I mean, I know we have ourselves here, we have many businesses that want to do that. I, like my, like the incumbent here, Sandy, me and him both didn't finish college. Um, both of us have been educated in the School of Hot and Arts, okay? Um, and we've hit the grindstone and we've made ourselves to where we're at right now. Um, and that was because of good basic academics in our, in our life. Um, the other thing is I'm going to be committed to doing that, to making sure that we look at things that way. Um, and I'm also looking for teamwork. I'm one of those people that believe that when we have a bunch of people on our team and people that challenge us sometimes, Vance, you know, um, and, and people that come out and help us as much as we can, Barb, right, to, to make us a better team, um, that's where I'm looking at. Safety is going to be a big deal for me, and I agree with Sandy. Look, um, one of the things that I saw in the schools with our guardian program, and yesterday the question that came up, we have a computer system that watches what our students are on constantly. So if they hit the internet and they put how to build a bomb, 
there's a flag that goes up and it's a cool guardian system and it goes into it. So I was confused when the question came up. Um, and so that's why I, I leaned over to Sandy and said, man, I really messed up that question, didn't I? Um, but the problem with that is I believe in the guardian system. I like it. Um, I had a, an early question when I was starting, um, I was one of the supervisors at the school and they said, hey, what about arming just the teachers? And I said, let's put a break on that. I want to make sure that the people who are, we are putting in charge of holding a gun on our campuses, okay, is somebody that the SRO can work with. And I talked to a lot of SROs, and we want to work with the Guardian program, okay. Um, having an extra pair of hands on campus, having an extra weapon on campus.